Okay, so in this video, what we're going to learn about is how to estimate dissociation energies using what's known as the burge sponer technique. So the basic idea is this. One of the defining characteristics of the harmonic oscillator is that it has infinitely many uh, excited states that are all, infinitely many eigenstates that are all evenly spaced apart. So for example, if you look on the left here, this is the energy diagram for a harmonic oscillator and all the eigenstates just march on like a ladder straight on up. On the right we have a what we have is a anharmonic oscillator, so a, a Morse oscillator, which is still a simple model that we can solve analytically, but it is now anharmonic. And you see two two important things. So one is that the the energies are no longer evenly spaced, right? So the spacing between the first two energies is not the same as between the second and the third or the third and the fourth and so on and also that there is this there is a maximum energy above this above which a particle would have enough energy to escape this well right and so what that means is that <clears throat> in the in the morse oscillator case you will you will have a maximum bound energy or Equivalently, that means you'll have a maximum quantum number that can be bound within the Morse oscillator. Okay, and so, so to be a little bit more concrete, what we have on the left is for a harmonic oscillator, you have you have really no such n max, or that the n max is equal to infinity, where n max is the maximum allowed quantum number for a bound particle, and for a Morse oscillator or for many other similar types of anharmonic oscillators, you will in fact have some maximum quantum number above which the eigenstates are unbound or they, uh, they, they, they no longer you know, have these nice well-separated energies. And one consequence of these things being unbound is that now you have no quantization in the energy. Right? So at this blue line that I've shown on the right, you can have an energy just slightly above it as well, just slightly above that, and so on. So what, what happens is that if your energy, so I'll write it down here, if your energy is greater than the dissociation energy, the dissociation energy is this the difference between the bottom of the well and the value at infinity, Okay, then if, if E is an allowed energy, then E plus some infinitesimally small extra bit of energy is also allowed. All right, and the major difference, just to summarize this, what this means is that uh, the energy difference on the left between an N plus one and an N in the nth state, which we would normally write as delta E, which is something that, which is the actual observable uh, energy that's allowed. So delta E of n is, is equal to this difference. And this is always going to be h bar omega, or if you're talking about this in terms of wave numbers, you'll have, you'll have it written like this. All right, so it's always h bar omega or omega tilde if you're in wave numbers. Whereas, uh, and, that, and that is independent of n, whereas for a Morse oscillator, this, uh, this delta G at some point goes to zero as n gets large. And the idea behind the burge sponer plot is that we're going to use this fact and what we know about the Morse oscillator, or, or rather what we know about good approximations for anharmonic oscillators in order to try and estimate both n max, this maximum allowed quantum number, and also to, to use that to determine, 
determine the dissociation energy, D naught. Okay, so how does this work? So we start off with a model for the, so, so first what we need is a model for the energy. And we'll use the energies of the Morse oscillator because these are analytic and, and so we know what they look like and they're also a pretty good model for other types of anharmonic potentials. And so the energies for the Morse oscillator and wave numbers are given by this. So this is omega e n plus one half. Okay, and this is this should look familiar from just the general form that we write for anharmonic potentials, where again the omega e is closely related to the fundamental energy, the, the fundamental frequency of the oscillator, and this xe is the anharmonicity constant. All right, and so if we take this as our model for the energies that are allowed for a Morse oscillator, then as you'll see very shortly, if you look at the energy difference between two successive states, which we're writing as this delta g of n, which is g of n plus 1 minus g of n. Okay, and then this is equal to omega e tilde 1 minus 2 x e tilde n plus 1. Okay, so when we take a look at this, we'll see that eventually as n gets large enough here, so this n that is in the right-hand side part, for a large enough n, this whole thing should approach zero, right? You have one minus two xe n plus one. So that is a one minus a positive term that is proportional to n plus one. And so for a large enough quantum number, this thing will end up being close to zero. And the value of this which happens, this will tell us something about the, the maximum quantum number. And so the idea behind the birch boner plot is to just make this really clear right away. And so what you do when you do a birch boner plot is, is the following. Okay, so you have a, you want to make a plot, you're going to plot this delta G of n against n plus one, right? So you take your real data, it will have some scatter to it. So what this means is that you measure as many different transitions as you can. Sometimes you can only measure that exact transition and you have to back out whether it, or which transition is actually going on. Or if you're able to figure out exactly what g of 3 and g of 5 and so on are, then you can back calculate the difference between the successive ones. Okay, now there will be some scatter in, in your data, and so what you do is you, you draw a best fit line, best fit curve of some sort. Um, I'm, you know, this is a straight line because it's easy to do a straight line visually, but in the in these days, what you would do is measure as many as you can and then fit a more complicated curve to it than just a straight line. And now what this is telling you is that at the bottom right-hand corner, what you have is you, you find, based on this, you basically have found at this intercept a value we're going to call n star, such that delta g of n star is equal to, to zero. Okay, so that, that's what this intercept is telling us. All right, and we know that, we know from the discussion previously that when delta G of N star is equal to zero, then we suddenly have an unbound particle, right? So when the, the difference between energy levels approaches zero, then we have an unbound particle. And so that means that the maximum, allow, maximum bound energy must be the, the largest integer that is less than N star. And then from this, what, so, that, so this immediately lets us figure out what n max is. This gives us the maximum quantum number, which tells us how many different 
uh, how many different bound states there are in this potential. And then the other thing that this tells us is that if we add up all of these energy differences, right? So if, so if we add up from n equals zero to n max uh, minus one, actually, this delta g of n, then this tells us this is exactly what d zero is, right? So this is the total energy difference between the maximum bound state and the um, and the the zero state. So this is equal to g of n max minus g of zero. Okay, and so by combining this equation, which tells us how to figure out what d zero is, with this value of d of n max, the Birch Boner plot gives us a way to estimate dissociation energies by extrapolating the difference between successive energy levels for an anharmonic oscillator. And this is pretty cool because this means that we can now estimate dissociation energies, so things like how much energy does it take to make a molecule blow apart by just measuring vibrational spectra starting from the ground state.